This is a video about why Robert House is ultimately bad for the Mojave. I say this fully aware that there is no good choice for the Mojave. So while I do believe that House is a bad choice, I'm not saying that he's not the best choice. He very well may be. But that is a topic we will tackle after we beat Fallout New Vegas with each faction ending. For now, I want to explain why I believe that House would be bad for the Mojave. I recently completed a series of videos where we explored the entire ending to Fallout New Vegas if we side with Mr. House. In the comments of those videos, I discovered that the number one complaint viewers had with siding with Mr. House is how Mr. House decided to handle the Brotherhood of Steel and the Kings. House is completely unwilling to even consider a peaceful resolution with the Brotherhood of Steel, which means if we side with House, we have to kill them all. And we learn in the game's end slides that no matter what other choice we made concerning the Kings and Freeside, if we side with Mr. House, his Securitrons invade Freeside and kill all the Kings. Those two events are very distasteful, and I do think they are reason enough to not side with House. But all of the other factions do equally distasteful things. From a gameplay perspective, it may be more satisfying to side with Yes Man or the NCR because you have the option to leave those factions alive, but both of those factions are perfectly happy if we destroy the Brotherhood of Steel in the course of our gameplay. They don't really have a morally higher ground to stand upon. And so my reason for believing that House is a bad choice for the Mojave is that he's just one man. During the course of the House ending, we learn that House is directly responsible for saving the Strip. By 2065, I deemed it a mathematical certainty that an atomic war would devastate the Earth within 15 years. Every projection I ran confirmed it. I knew I couldn't save the world, nor did I care to, but I could save Vegas, and in the process, perhaps save mankind. I set to work immediately. I thought I had plenty of time to prepare. As it turned out, I was 20 hours short. On the day of the Great War, 77 atomic warheads targeted Las Vegas and its surrounding areas. My networked mainframes were able to predict and force transmit disarm code subsets to 59 warheads, neutralizing them before impact. Laser cannons mounted on the roof of the Lucky 38 destroyed another nine warheads. The rest got through, though none hit the city itself. A suboptimal performance, admittedly. If only the platinum chip had arrived a day sooner. At the time, I expressed the thought that if anyone deserved to be overlord of the Strip, wow, it would be House. He's been there for over 200 years, he's invested an enormous amount of money into the Strip, and he's put his own assets on the line to protect the Strip and to rebuild it after the apocalypse. House has put work into the Strip. In a sense, he deserves to be master of it. The problem I have with this idea is that there are more people than just House living in the Strip. There were the residents of Vault 21, whom he ejected from their home, likely manipulating the rules of that society to do so. Those Vault Dwellers had every right to keep their own home, and House had no moral claim over the Vault. After all, his defenses did not defend the Vault. The Vault was already protected underground. Plus, after protecting Vegas, House falls asleep for 200 years. A lot can happen in 200 years, and I'm not sure I like the idea of some demigod from the past suddenly appearing and then demanding ownership of land already being used, no matter what his claim may be over it. Yes, he is responsible for bringing in other tribes into Vegas, giving them homes, setting up the casinos, but we learn in the ending slides that House was not content to just be master of Vegas. If given the victory, he invades nearby Freeside, Freeside which he did nothing to protect when the bombs fell and has no moral claim over. One can argue that his Securitrons will do a better job of establishing law and order than the Kings did, but it is at the expense of the Kings. 
House would make his Securitrons judges of life and death, vaporizing people in the streets for any perceived infraction, whereas the kings would be able to use human reason to judge each situation as it appeared. Perhaps there would be some sort of human nuance that the kings, as leaders of Freeside, would be able to pick up on, but that House's robotic cold Securitrons wouldn't. I worry that having Securitrons in charge of Freeside would lead to greater injustice. Benny summed it up well. Mr. House hides Vegas under his skirt when the bombs fall a thousand years ago, so it belongs to him? Forever? You buy that? Baby, every boss has a line to explain why he's special. Why everyone's gotta do what he says. You're just figuring that out? And then, towards the end of the game, we learn House's ultimate goal. He has ambitions far beyond Vegas and Freeside. Even though we jumpstart the El Dorado substation to give Vegas all the power it could ever need, part of House's plan is to take control of Hoover Dam. Hoover Dam, which he did not save from the nuclear apocalypse. Hoover Dam, which he did not build. Hoover Dam, which he has no moral claim over. At least, none greater than the other factions vying for it. And when he gets his hands on Hoover Dam, he doesn't distribute the water to everyone evenly. No, he takes it for Vegas. And he sells the rest to the people of the NCR for an exorbitant fee. In the order of withdrawal document that we give to the NCR, we find, quote, So long as NCR military personnel comply with this order to withdraw, electricity and water will continue to flow from Hoover Dam to the NCR. A. Electricity, 5 caps per kilowatt hour. B. Water, 5 caps per gallon. Now, I don't know what the exchange rate is between caps in the Fallout universe and our own money today, but if we assume that $1 equals 1 cap, taking a look at January power consumption for 2018 in the United States, we paid on average 12.23 cents per kilowatt hour. So if caps directly convert to dollars, then House's price for electricity here is 40.4 times more expensive than what we're paying today. But water is insane. I couldn't find any national data, but looking at how much people in Seattle where I live pay for water, we pay $0.0085 per gallon for tap water. That makes the price that House set for the water from Hoover Dam 58 0.8 times more expensive than what we have to pay for water in our own world. Now, this, of course, doesn't take into account the crazy inflation of the Fallout universe, but we know how much work we have to put in to earn a single cap in the Fallout universe and what people are willing to pay for doing odd jobs. 50 caps here, 100 caps there. If we assume that citizens of the NCR only use 8 hours of electricity a day, then they're paying 1,200 caps a month for the privilege. The U.S. estimates that today people use, on average, at the low end, 80 gallons of water per day. But if NCR citizens in the Fallout universe tried to do that, it would cost them 12,000 caps a month to buy that water from Mr. House. I wondered when we learned this in my series, what this would do to the poor people of the NCR, who would likely be taxed out the wazoo by the NCR for the privilege of having water and power from Hoover Dam. How could free citizens even survive that kind of taxation? House's quest to be master of Vegas and Hoover Dam could have consequences reaching all the way to California. Consequences that could potentially destabilize the entire economy of the NCR, putting everyday people out of work and making them homeless. Now, despite this, we could use the Wild West argument. The Mojave in 2281 has no established law and order. Sure, the NCR is trying to move in and annex Nevada, but when we arrive at the beginning of the game, no one is in control. No one has written laws. There is no justice system. In this kind of environment, the Wild West argument is you take what you can get. Use your might or your wiles to take what you want from whomever you want and to viciously defeat those who stand in your way. If we accept this Wild West mentality, then we really have no grounds to criticize Mr. House because that is essentially what he's doing. He is using his might, he's using his smarts to turn New Vegas into a world that benefits him and maybe by extension, some other people. 
I don't believe, however, that that's the way the world works. Not today, and certainly not in the Fallout universe. In the Fallout universe, time and time again, we find people banding together to form communities, to recreate governments, and to establish law and order. From Shady Sands to Megaton to Diamond City, we find people who reject the Wild West mentality and instead believe in society, who instead choose to rebuild civilization. To his credit, House wants to rebuild civilization, as he says when he talks about his ambition to send people back into outer space. New Vegas is more than a city. It's the remedy to mankind's derailment. The city's economy is a blast furnace in which can be forged the steel of a new rail line running straight to a new horizon. What is the NCR? A society of people desperate to experience comfort, ease, luxury. A society of customers. With all that money pouring in, give me 20 years and I'll reignite the high technology development sectors. 50 years and I'll have people in orbit. 100 years and my colony ships will be heading for the stars to search for planets unpolluted by the wrath and folly of a bygone generation. But a civilization with himself as its head. We have an option to confront him about this, to accuse him of being a despot, but he prefers another word. I prefer the term autocrat. I would rule as a chief executive. I would not answer to a board of directors or any other entity. Nothing to impede progress. And he justifies this by pointing out the clear failings of democracy. If you want to see the fate of democracies, look out the windows. The problem with this logic is that for every failing of democracy, there are ten failings of despotism, of autocracy, of dictatorships and monarchies. Yes, in the Fallout universe, democracies participated in the worst apocalypse of human history, as did communists, let's not forget, but it only turned into the worst apocalypse in human history because of the technology they had at their fingertips. Is House to suggest that had an autocrat been in charge instead of an elected republic, that the nuclear apocalypse of 2077 would not have happened? Surely he would never suggest such a thing, because history tells us the exact opposite. Autocrats and dictators have committed mass atrocities using whatever was the appropriate technology available. Is House to suggest that if these people had nuclear weapons at their fingertips that they would not have used them? So House is being disingenuous here. The form of American government is not to blame for the nuclear apocalypse of 2077. Such an argument completely ignores the other half of the equation, which were the Chinese communists in this universe, and it flies in the face of what we know about human nature, that people will use whatever technology they have available and commit any atrocity to achieve their ends. When we ask him what would prevent him from abusing his power, his only response is, My judgment. I have no interest in abusing others, just as I have no interest in legislating or otherwise dictating what people do in their private time. Nor have I any interest in being worshipped as some kind of machine god messiah. I am impervious to such corrupting ambitions. But autocracy? Firm control in the hands of a technological and economic visionary? Yes, that Vegas shall have. His good judgment. The problem with having power is that often, unless you are restrained, that power can muddle one's best judgment. Even good people can make evil decisions once they get too much power. And that's because dictators and autocrats will do whatever they can to cling to power. This allows them to justify any atrocity. Whether it's using machetes to hack down the camps of your opposition, nerve gas to destroy their villages, or securitrons to annihilate them. The problem with House is that he's one man. He's accountable to no one but himself. We are putting arguably the most power the Mojave has ever seen into the hands of a man, and he's asking us simply to trust him. Now, maybe we can trust him. After all, he's super smart. After all, he's quick to tell us that he was a billionaire many times over before he was even 30 years old. And he did predict Armageddon, and was the only one who took steps to save Vegas. But being smart isn't enough. 
There are plenty of smart people who have made evil decisions, who have even made stupid decisions. Intelligence and wisdom are not the same. It takes intelligence to build a robot army, but it demands wisdom to wield it, or to not wield it. I think House is politically savvy, but the problem with House's personality is that he takes risks. One of the most striking risks, and what I think displays his lack of wisdom the best, is when he tells us the story of how the Omeritas came to be. Yes, though at the time they called themselves the Slitherkin, a vicious clan, not that that's changed exactly. They were nomads, capable fighters, but their specialty was betrayal. They'd invite travelers into their yurts, drug them, murder, or enslave them. They took pride in their craft. I don't think Omertas saw other people as people at all. Everyone else was just prey. They reminded me of a certain criminal element Vegas used to attract. I told them some stories, gave them some clothes, and they ran with it. In that story, we learn that House purposefully recruited a tribe infamous for their betrayal. I mean, just think about that. He knew that they liked to betray whomever they did business with. And so what did he do? He chose to do business with them. That's not wise. Why? There were plenty of other tribes out there. Why did he choose to give a valuable rich casino to the tribe known for betrayal? And of course, what do they do? They betray him. <laughs> it's, it's, this is something he should have seen coming. There are a few other instances of his gambling nature. In order to get his hands on the technology of Vault 21, he had to beat the leaders of that vault in blackjack. We are led to believe that he cheated, but it's possible that he didn't cheat and he just happened to win. If that's the case, then he put the future of his vision for the Las Vegas Strip literally up to chance. Another example is when he sends the courier to the Securitron vault beneath the fort. He gives the courier the platinum chip, the key to a Securitron vault, and the power to either wake up the Securitrons and put this army in the hands of House, or to destroy them and completely ruin his chance of ever dominating the Strip. When we talk with him about this, his only response is, I like to think you have enough sense to do the right thing. The rewards for doing so are immense as are the punishments for not doing so. Listen to me very carefully. I've waited too long for this moment for you to go fouling it up on a lark. Do as I say, and your rewards will be immense. Thwart me, and your punishment will become the purpose of my existence. He's gambling. The loss of his Securitrons in this vault is absolutely devastating, as is clear by his response if we choose to do so. Do you have the slightest idea of what you've done? Of what you've destroyed? You've doomed Vegas to be ruled by corrupt bureaucrats or fanatical savages. Single-handedly, you brought mankind's best hopes of forward progress crashing down. No punishment would be too severe. Now I suppose we could argue that this was his only option. Perhaps he did the best he could with the materials he had at hand. He has this courier, a courier who has an open invitation to the fort, and he needs to get to the fort to access his Securitron, so... Okay, maybe this really is his only option. But it just seems like such a gamble. He's risking the future of his empire on the whims of one courier. I find it hard to believe that there was no other option to better guarantee House's success. So in House, we find a man who's a bit of a risk taker. He likes to gamble. He is politically savvy, but he can't predict the future. He was, after all, able to predict the apocalypse, but ultimately he got the date wrong. And like the dictators of bygone eras, he is ruthless and will do anything to maintain his power, slaughtering entire factions just so that he can establish control. Flush with his victory, Mr. House sent Securitrons into Freeside, thinking to increase his control over the area. When fighting broke out, the kings fought valiantly, but were no match for the armored killing machines and were wiped out to the last man. And slaughtering others just because he thinks they're silly. Because they're ridiculous. Because they gallivant around the Mojave, pretending to be knights of yore. The world has no use for emotionally unstable techno-fetishists. Just wipe them out, will you? Now I take that back. 
House does have a reason for wanting to get rid of the Brotherhood of Steel. He's dealt with them in the past, he knows their character, he understands their codex, and he's probably right. If the Brotherhood had power, the Brotherhood would likely try to do something to take House's Securitrons away from him. We're talking about a coterie of bulging-eyed fanatics who think all pre-war technology belongs to them. They'll never accept my using an army of robots to defend New Vegas. While it's a fight I can win, I'd rather sidestep it altogether. The reports say Mr. House's robots are now using tech we've never heard of. We need to send a team up there soon. The problem with House's decision to just annihilate the faction as a whole is that he ignores the human angle of the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel. The Courier, however, knows it well. If we establish Paladin Edgar Hardin as leader of the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel, then sure, maybe Elder Hardin would be stupid enough to attack the Strip with his Brotherhood soldiers. But if we leave Elder McNamara as Elder of the Brotherhood, he would never attack the Strip. We know the man, we know his character. He's conservative and cautious. He doesn't want to see what happened at Helios 1 ever happen again. And so he would never attack House on the Strip. This is evidenced by his willingness to sign a treaty with the NCR, which is something we learn when we explore the NCR ending to the game. McNamara is willing to sign a peace treaty even with the very people who defeated him at Helios 1, slaughtering so many of his brothers and sisters. If he's willing to sign a peace treaty with them, why would he not be willing to sign a peace treaty with House? But House doesn't know about this. He doesn't know about the personality differences between Hardin and McNamara, and he doesn't bother to find out. He's just annoyed by them. He wants to see them gone, and so he sends the courier to massacre all of those people. Buried beneath tons of rubble, the Mojave chapter of the Brotherhood of Steel was no more. Had he sent an envoy to Elder McNamara at Hidden Valley, he might have been able to discover that McNamara was reasonable, and he might have been able to work out an agreement. But instead, he chose the easy way out. Now, this decision to eliminate the Brotherhood may be politically savvy. I have to admit, it does indeed remove threat, but it ignores their humanity, and a good leader must never ignore humanity. This point ties in with one advantage House has over all other autocrats. House is immortal. Many autocracies fail when the popular great leader becomes ill or dies. Perhaps the child that this autocrat gives his kingdom to is not the same man that his father was and can't establish control over his generals and other petty lords the way his father could. It is then when we start to see revolution. It is then when autocracies begin to crumble. House will never have that problem. He's lived for over 200 years. He is practically immortal. He will rule the Mojave forever and make as much profit as he possibly can. So my argument does not hinge on instability. I think House would likely create a pretty stable government. My criticism is his lack of humanity. Yes, it's true that a person's humanity can be lost in a huge bureaucratic government. But it can also be lost on a despot who doesn't see you as a person, but either sees you as an obstacle or something to consume to make himself more powerful. And clearly this is how House sees humanity. There was one time, only one time, where he expresses concern about the lives of everyday people. But it's only because those people patronize his casinos. If we suggest that he send in his Securitrons to obliterate the Omeritas, he says, Exactly how many civilians did you want to die in that crossfire? What he's really saying is, and what about all of the money I could have made off of those people whom you carelessly killed? Sure, I think House would create a stable government that would last for a very long time. But the man lacks humanity, and such a man should never be in power over the lives of others. I can't fathom giving the keys to the Mojave to one man. I don't care how good that one man is. I don't care how smart or politically savvy that one man is. I would much rather have a government in charge that gave more people a say in how they're governed. Yes, as House says, governments of the past did bring about the nuclear apocalypse. But autocracy is also a government of the past with a long and bloody history. 
I find it very hard to believe that an autocrat would have greater temperance with his hand hovering over the launch nukes button than a representative elected by the very people whose lives are at stake. Now, as I said at the beginning, House may be a bad choice for the Mojave, but that doesn't mean that he's not the best choice. We have yet to explore Caesar's Legion, the New California Republic, and an independent Vegas. After exploring all of those options, I very well may come back and say that, compared to the others, House might be the best choice, as flawed as he is. But we'll tackle that in an upcoming episode. I publish many videos each week here on my channel, so if you want to make sure you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I've finally got emojis. Sponsors now have access to ox emojis they can use in the live chat of my weekly show, Scotch and Smoke Rings, and all of my other live streams here on YouTube. You can become a sponsor by navigating to the gaming.youtube section of YouTube where you'll find a brand new sponsorship button on my channel. If you're interested in some Oxhorn merchandise, you can check out my shirt shop, where I have a wide range of designs, which you can find on a variety of products, including shirts, which come in both men's and women's sizes. The shirts come in a wide array of colors, and if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming either a sponsor here on YouTube or a patron on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with a brand new video.